So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your conference in Basel. There couldn't be a more important topic or a topic closer to my heart than investing in peace and sustainability. I'm only sorry I can't be with you in person and that's because right at the last minute they've brought in a negotiation rather ironically on sustainable finance. So one of the files I've been working on for a while is now going to be negotiated with the council so I really have to be in Strasbourg for that which is why I haven't got time to, to be with you and then get back unfortunately. Anyway, I'm going to share with you some of the ideas I've got about this, this theme and about how we need to address sustainability if we're going to have security and peace, not just in Europe, but across the world. So the first couple of slides are about climate change. And I think it's really important that we make that connection between climate change and security. I mean, I've got some statistics here about the impact climate change is having. And We've already seen really significant changes in our climate. So we've seen average surface temperature rising by 1.1 degree and most of that warming has taken place in the past 35 years. 17 of the 18 hottest years recorded since 1850 have occurred since 2000 and basically we're seeing more hot years every year as we go forward. This has meant that sea levels have risen and they've risen by over 8 inches in the past century. And we're also seeing a large increase in the number of extreme weather events and the level of ex excessive weather events. So they're becoming more extreme and we're seeing more of them. Now this is obviously having a really big impact on people's ability to live where they are. And the UNHCR has estimated that the annual average number of people displaced by these extreme weather events is more than 21 million now. So that's floods, storms, fires and generally extreme weather events are forcing people to move from their homes and we're going to see a lot more of that in times to come and we're going to see a lot more climate refugees. So moving on to the next slide, I'm sure you noticed back in October the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which is where all the governments of the world get together to agree about what's really happening with our climate and what we can do about it. They launched this report about what it would take to keep the global warming within 1.5 degrees and they said we've only got 12 years to act if we're going to do that. We know some of the things we've got to do. By far the most important is to give up the use of coal, fossil fuels as a whole, but especially coal. Coal is most urgent. And they say we have to reduce our coal consumption by one third by, um, in, within those 12 years, but I would say much faster than that. We also need to scale up renewable energy technologies, but they say that we can only stay within 1.5 degrees by actually sequestering carbon, so actually bringing carbon back from our atmosphere. And the way we farm and the way we use our land is really crucial there because we need to farm in a way that allows land to be carbon rich and to hold the maximum possible amount of carbon that's come back from the atmosphere. Unfortunately the later conference in Katowice um, in December was quite disappointing and I don't feel there was anything like enough action. The IPCC said we have to take rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes at all, in all aspects of society and that's not what we saw at COP24. We really need to have an urgent paradigm shift. The next slide is just a kind of decorative one to introduce you to this idea of sustainable finance and I think this is a really powerful tool that we can use to start making the changes, to really incentivise the changes that we need to see in our economies. Because nothing happens unless it's funded and if we change the way finance works then we can use that as a real lever on the whole of the European economy. So the first slide here really thinks about this idea of risk. Because in the world of finance and venture capital, risk is rewarded. So the greater risk you take, the more returns you can, you can gain for yourself. But actually, in the case of normal life, that's not how we think about it. We don't think, oh, wonderful, I'll go on a plane that's not safe because that'll be really risky. You know, we tend to be risk averse as individuals. But unfortunately, the finance world does not work like that. And so what we need to do is to rethink risk in terms of making greater security and stop rewarding risk-taking by financiers. And we also need to, in, to price ecological risks into the finance system. Some of these risks are really so huge that there's no way of pricing them. You know, what is the price of the continuation of human life on Earth? It's really priceless. And that's the problem with trying to bring climate risks and ecological risks into this finance paradigm. But one thing we can be really clear about, and that's that some of the ways that we're 
we're active economically now are increasing those risks and we need to get those out of our economy as well as out of our financial system. And just as one example, for anybody who's under the age of about 40 now, we know that we're phasing fossil fuels out of our economy. So if your pension fund contains any assets that are connected with fossil fuels, then you've been missold and that pension won't pay you an income when you come to retire. So I'm going to just talk about, there's a, there's a big plan, uh, an action plan from the Commission on Sustainable Finance, and I'm just going to talk about two aspects of it. And the first one, as you can see on the next si slide, is about strengthening disclosure. So disclosure is effectively about how finance companies tell you what they're doing with your money. And amazingly, what I've found by working on this agenda is that they think it's actually fine that you don't know what they're doing with your money. So we've said from the Parliament that we must have mandatory disclosure of carbon related assets and ultimately that we must know about the impact of your pension fund or your savings on environmental impacts but also social impacts and governance impacts and we need that to be extended right down the value chain so you need to know when you go into a bank when you open a bank account what is that bank doing in terms of um, whether they have money invested in say a Malaysian palm oil plantation and we know that having this better information, on the next slide now, we know that if people had that better information, they would be absolutely horrified by the kinds of things banks and pension funds are doing with their money. Because surveys have shown that customers actually do prioritise these ESG risks when they're making financial decisions themselves. And you can see that, for example, in the case of divestment, where, which is a really clear indication of public concern that people don't want their money invested in arms or in fossil fuels. And the latest figure now, by 2016, divestment had reached 5.2 trillion. So when you give people the information and the choice, they do move their money away from dirty industries and destructive processes. And the second area of the sustainable finance agenda I'd like to talk about is the sustainability taxonomy. So the next slide shows you this process we're undergoing about how we define what is a sustainable investment and what is not a sustainable investment. So here I've illustrated a white list and a black list. At the moment the process is only about defining the white list and one of the things we're trying to do here in the Parliament is to say there's no point in saying what's sustainable unless you also say what can never be included in a sustainable investment. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the white list that the Commission's put forward, so things like dealing with climate change, protecting the quality of our water and marine resources, developing the circular economy, preventing pollution and regenerating healthy ecosystems, great. I would agree that's all the sustainable investment. But we need to also be clear about what we could never market in a sustainable bond or a sustainable pension fund. So I would say, and this relates very much to the theme of today about peace, we should never have the arms trade or weapons as part of a sustainable investment. Similarly, we know that fossil fuels are driving climate change, they're creating an insecure world, as I've already discussed, and they're also insecure in terms of your future investment, and so they should be never, never included in sustainable investments. And lastly, I would say we should exclude nuclear energy as well, not only because it's environmentally damaging and it's dangerous for public health, but also because of that close relationship between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. So, um, just moving on to more general points now, I have long argued that we shouldn't actually have an arms trade. I mean, I'm, I'm a Quaker and I just, find it, I just find it inconceivable that you could profit from selling weapons of death to other people. But I can't make that argument, I can't win that argument anyway in the European Parliament. And that's because people will make this, I think, totally immoral justification saying, oh, well, there's jobs, you know, there's jobs making weapons, so we have to protect those jobs. I would say we should change the economy so those people can have a job with dignity and where they can respect themselves, not a job making weapons that causes death for other people. But the EU is the second largest arms supplier in the world after the US. And really tragically, a lot of those weapons find their way into the hands of people who are in some of the most war-torn areas of the world. So 40% of the weapons manufactured in the EU in 2016 went to countries in the Middle East and North Africa. And we're even exporting arms to Saudi Arabia, where they're used to fuel conflicts, and particularly in Yemen, where the Saudis are involved in what I think is certainly an illegal war, and they are causing the deaths of children and from famine and also from direct attack from those weapons. In November last year, the European Parliament 
voted that if member states don't keep to the, e the Parliament's rules or the EU's rules on how weapons should be sold, then they should face sanctions. But at the moment, we have this sort of code of conduct for arms sales, but countries just ignore it in order to make a profit. And I think we need to be much stricter here because we, our European arms manufacturers, are the cause of a lot of conflicts we see in the world. So Germany and the Netherlands have stopped selling weapons to the Yemen, but I'm very embarrassed and ashamed to say that Britain is still profiting from that illegal war. As you can see on the next slide, as we, if we go ahead with Brexit, I mean, I'm still trying to stop Brexit, but if we go ahead with that, then what are we going to be selling? We're going to be losing a lot of the finance jobs, and there's going to be a real pressure to increase sales of arms and to undermine the care with which we find out where those arms are going and what they're doing. You can see on the slide the um, really significant arms sales still from Britain to Saudi. You can see our Prime Minister meeting up with the um, Saudi head of state, and basically, this is what I'm afraid the Tories have in mind for us after Brexit, expanding arms sales. And you can see on the slide as well the really destructive impact that had in Saudi. So 5,000 children dead and um, 400,000 malnourished in Yemen as a result, partly of arms produced in the UK. And we've also doubled our arms sales to these very human rights abusers. It's totally hypocritical to argue that we should protect human rights and at the same time be selling arms to human rights abusers. So what can we do about this in the European institutions? Well, I think trade, as illustrated on the next slide, is really crucial here. We're one of the most powerful trading blocks, really the, the most powerful alongside the US. And we have this mantra, you can see Cecilia Malmstrom on the slide there, the Trade Commissioner for the EU, and I've, had, I've, I've spoken to her in public forums several times where she uses this mantra, trade for all. EU trade should benefit everybody, but it doesn't. You can see it doesn't from what I've said about arms sales. But also the way our companies based in Europe abuse the human rights of people across the world shows you that trade is not working for everybody. And what we've got to change to make this trade for all mantra a reality is to make sure that the parts of our trade deals that deal with environmental protection or protecting indigenous people's right to their land or making sure that we don't have conflict minerals and so on, make sure that is in a legally actionable part of these treaties, which at the moment it's not. It's all very well to have fine words about this, but what you have to have is legally actionable treaties. And I don't think we should sign any more trade deals unless these rights are protected. They're in black and white and people can defend them. And a process that would help to make that work on a global basis is the UN Binding Treaty, as you can see on the next slide here. This is now a, a process under discussion at the UN and I think it's, it's really positive. We're not there yet, but we're really starting to make progress and the UN Working Group on the Binding Treaty um, launched its first draft which was debated in Geneva in October 2018 and I was able to be part of those discussions. So what we're talking about here is a legally binding treaty that all corporations would be subject to no matter where they operated in the world. So if they broke human rights, as you can see here in the case of the Rana Plaza disaster, even people in poor countries like Bangladesh, they would have the legal right to take a case against this company for violating their human rights and it would end corporate impunity right through the supply chain. So this is a, a live proposal and I think it's something I would really recommend you find out more about and get behind because we need to build political support for it and make it a reality. One of the other areas I work on here a lot is on, on tax policy. And again, it's the tax avoidance, it's the theft basically of money from many countries of the world through unfair tax practices that drive conflict and drive people out of their homes to seek a better chance at life elsewhere. EU countries are unfortunately competing with each other to to, to benefit from lower tax laws so that they can attract corporations in. So the corporations start this race to the bottom and I'm very sad to say European countries are playing that game. We're all losing tax revenue in our own countries and it's also really putting pressure on the poorer countries of the world who don't have enough money then to invest in public services and they, don't, they can't have a good livelihood at home so they're, they're migrating. So basically tax policy and the failure of tax policy to ensure justice at a global level is a key driver of global insecurity and global population movement. And lastly, just coming now directly to the issue of peace, 
I said earlier that, that I'm a Quaker myself and I was really pleased to be able to launch this report from uh, Quaker Council for European Affairs which is about actually actively building peace and as Quakers we have this, um, we don't have a very long theology but one of the things we have to do is to seek out the causes of war. So it's not enough just to say I won't fight a war when a war comes, you have to think about what it is that really gives rise to those wars and what causes wars in the world and I've already said I think climate change and um, unfair tax policy are two of those things. But we need to go further than that, we need to really start investing in peace building and what would the world be like if we invested as much money in preparing for peace as we do in preparing for war. So I was really pleased to be able to launch this very practical guide in the European Parliament, it's written by Olivia Kamex and she's really done some great work I think and it's, it's basically a practical guide to what you can do in 11 different sectors. So if you're a diplomat, if you're an educator, if you're a politician or a lawyer, and also for artists and people that work in the media, what's your role in a conflict zone or in a zone of instability to help create the conditions for long-term and lasting peace? So I hope that's given you a few things to think about. Um, I'm really glad that you're having this meeting and as I said I'm, I'm sorry not to be able to be with you but I hope it goes well and I really congratulate you on taking on this important issue and I hope you have a very successful and productive meeting. Thank you for letting me join in this way.